We're starting over, as we mentioned earlier, and we're, so we're in Genesis 1, and I was looking at Genesis 1 again this week, and like always when you read through Scripture, something different will kind of pop out to you. And I'm willing to bet that everyone here could quote the first statement in the Bible, roughly. I mean, translations could be slightly different, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what's amazing is if a person believed that, it would change the whole way they approach life. I, I find it amazing, really, that there are so many people that try to come up with ways that beauty and order came out of chaos. And I don't think that's scientific. I don't think science can prove creation. But if, I mean, you, you take a look at the very scientific method. The way we try to arrive at conclusions is we look at the data, we look at the facts, and we try to say, what explains these? And I find it just preposterous that you have a universe that I can't comprehend the distances. A light year is a little too much for me. If light travels 186,000 miles, is it a second or a minute? Oh, see, it's even worse. If it tra travels 186,000 miles per second, how far does light go in a year? And you know there are things out there a hundred and more light years away. And as near as we know, every place that you can go, things function by the same laws. Vacuum this way. And there are things we don't understand. That, you know, a lot of the tiny particles they've found and then things like black holes, I don't understand all these things. But what I notice is that scientists are able to explain things because you can start from a common base of law, of order. And see, to my simple mind, and I admit, simple mind, that means a creator. But when you, when you read this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. What does that mean? And I love in Hebrew, formless and void, tohu and bohu. <laughs> tohu and bohu. I mean, that's, doesn't that just say it? Uh, <laughs> but... Greg, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I heard some interesting comments from people like Richard Dawkins and some of these other people. And they, they had an interview with another leading atheist. And they finally got down, to, after they got through all of this bashing of belief and faith and all of that stuff, they, they finally got down to it and said, well, the interviewer was asking this, and I forgot what his name was, but anyway. They finally got down and said, well, how do you think it happened? How do you think that all of this, what we have, came into existence? And I was amazed how stupid his answer was. <laughs> he just said, well, it could have been that this little fluff of stuff came floating down <laughs> through the atmosphere and lighted here, and then it found fertile soil and started to grow. I, it is, are you kidding me? I, I mean, after all of these, these scientific ways of their saying, God cannot be, faith is one of these things that mindless, silly people believe in, and then they give an answer. <laughs> it can't be serious that you really, I mean, you think that what I think is dumb, I'd rather believe what I got than you. No, it, it is funny, and, and I think we do have to be uh, honest with ourselves that 
what we call faith and belief cannot be apprehended by science because science does measure tangible things. It measures uh, things that can be weighed. And, but on the other hand, it, it's amazing that we, one of the bedrocks of investigation is believing that when you find something that looking, measuring, uh, studying what you find will tell you something about the Creator. And see, the, Paul says that. He says, people are without excuse because God's nature is evident in the things He's made. And, uh, you know, you, you mentioned how dumb the explanation becomes because when it comes down to it, the way God created our minds, can anybody here comprehend eternity? That doesn't work. I remember as a boy lying on my bed thinking, how could things always be? They had to start. And that, that bothered me. I don't know why that bothered me. I'd sit there and say, well, how every explanation just left me lost because the way my mind works, things start and they end. They don't, how could something, you know, always be? And, uh, but, you know, I was looking through this and the other thing, and how, do any of you have kind of a loose idea of what happened on every day of creation? If you don't, that's one of the things I think is worth finding out. Just study it. And it's not a big thing to understand. It's a little bit like memorizing the fruits of the Spirit. There are certain things that I've found if I don't memorize them, I don't have them. Or like 1 Corinthians 13, what is love? And I've almost forgotten this. Uh, but it, it's not that hard to go memorize. I think it's like nine things. Love is patient, love is kind, does not envy, it's not boast, does not boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not easily angered. Uh, nope. It's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, keeps no record of wrong, does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth, always protects, trusts, hopes, and perseveres. Now, you'd be amazed you can memorize that. And if, if this is, I think, a worth a thing worth memorizing. You know what I found out I don't have memorized that's kind of embarrassing? How many of you here could write the 12 apostles? See, I thought I knew them and I tried. I think I came up with 10. <laughs> and, and, and I honestly think it's not a matter of salvation. It's just, it helps to know it. And what I noticed when I looked at the six days of creation, I think you all know what happened on the seventh day. God rested. But the six days, it mentions that God saw it and it was good eight times in the story of creation. You know, it starts off with what I just described to you, this, this sense of, if you had to, to explain it, where it says the earth is formless and void, darkness is over the surface of the deep, the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. What, what does that impart to you? It gives me this sense of, I don't know if chaos, but almost. It, I don't sense organization. I don't sense... <coughs> Sister Betsy. I just know I always felt like, ooh, I would like to have been somewhere and watched it. Yeah. And, and, and what's the first thing that God does when he sees this formless and void? The tohu and bohu. Let there be light. And so, what happens the first day of creation? God says, let there be light. And here, a couple of things I'll just mention today, we don't have a lot of time, and you probably already know this, but because my mind is simple, if I get a couple of things to hang things on, it helps me. What I notice in the story of creation is that God keeps saying it was good, and He keeps saying things are separated. Separate is what creates holiness, right? Something is holy because it's separate. Well, when, he, when God says, let there be light, what happens? There becomes a separation between light and darkness. Have you ever noticed that there's something in human nature that wants to say there's no difference? We can all see 
the deeds of darkness. We can see the deeds of light, and yet there's something that says it's all the same. There's no difference. Well, the story of creation starts that God created it, and then it says, he said, let there be light, and God separated the light from the darkness. This is something that, that goes through the whole uh, story of creation. Then he says he called the light day and he called the dark night. And then the next day is this incomprehensible to me. And I, I, if someone has a good handle on this, I would love to hear your explanation. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the water, waters from the waters. I struggle with that. I, I think I might know what's going on. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. Now, does the King James say firmament? I, I, I think... God called the expanse heaven. So it says there were waters and God put heaven between these two waters and there was evening and there was morning, a second day. Just an interesting note. It never says in the second day where he separated these waters that it was good. I'm not saying it wasn't. It's just interesting that it doesn't say it here. Sister Colleen. This version says sky. And I've always heard that it never rained until Noah. Is that true that there was just mist? Well, people say that it never rained, but I'm not sure... I'm not sure we can say that, but I know a lot of people believe it, and I, I don't know that I can prove it didn't. But, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this real quickly as we go through the days of creation. How many of you know the days of creation are very logical and very illogical? Go ahead, Teresa. Well, just from, from input, I guess, from science, that's what it was Yeah, and see, that's that. This 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 second day talks about the sky or the heavens. In Hebrew, it is Shemaim, the heavens. But the sky or heavens, either one would be a good translation. But there's these waters. So we'll agree that the Bible is calling space or something waters, as well as what's on the earth. And then the third day, it says the waters below the heavens are gathered into one place, the oceans that Teresa's talking about. And let the dry land appear. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas and he saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, fruit trees bearing fruit. The earth brought forth vegetation. God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning a third day. What is unique about this? We have vegetation. What don't we have yet? What's going to happen on the fourth day? No, the fourth day. Come on. The sun and the moon. How are we having vegetation without the sun? And yet God... Here's my point. The Bible is not a science book. Yeah, exactly. Because let there be light is the first thing. And then the sun and the moon. All I'm saying is that I completely believe this. I know I don't totally understand it. Teresa. Some, I read some a long time ago. He would have a lot better... So in, so in his, I don't see it as a problem, but I think it's very possible that you're right. 
that the sun is there, but it's, we're not aware of it till the fourth day. And, and I, I, I would just point out that this is true, and it's what God told Moses, but if you try to impose a strict scientific regime on it, you're going to blow your circuits, or you'll do what I think is very unfortunate. You'll start telling God what he can do. And my view is we find out what God did and agree with him. So the third day there's vegetation. And see, that, Colleen, that's why I can't believe that there wasn't rain before that. But I admit there's no proof. The first proof of rain is with Noah. That at least the, that the Bible mentions it. Go ahead, Greg. No, I, I think that's very true, and I, and I think what you just brought out, Teresa, is also true here, that if God had allowed any of us to be witnesses of this, and he put Ron on the earth, put me in the sky, Greg on top of a mountain, and we saw the exact same thing, how many of you know that our stories would be different? We'd all be describing the same thing, and we'd all describe what we saw, but our stories would be different. Because we're human. We're not God. We, you know what I'm saying? We don't see the whole thing at once. And it, see, here's the vegetation, and it's good. And, and here's the other thing when I read this, I cannot make this a 24-hour day. The way this reads, just that's not saying it might not be. I could be wrong. But when I read this, it sounds like a long expanse of time. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens, to separate the day from the night. So remember, we're separating. We separate the light from the darkness, the land from the water. That, then we have vegetation. And now we're going to have lights, and they're going to uh, separate the day from the night. And, and here's the interesting thing. We're talking about this on the fourth day, but we've already had three days and three nights. So as Greg just said, if we're going to impose a strict human understanding, we won't understand this. We won't get it. And you mentioned Hugh Ross. He's a brilliant guy. You know, it, I find it interesting that some of the smartest people completely see this make sense and others, like Greg was saying, think it's nonsense. So brains really aren't the issue here. So he separates the day from the night and let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And that's how it works. They're for signs. We, we, like we see these eclipses of the moon. Seasons, that means, that's the word moed. That uh, it, it describes the feasts. It describes winter, spring, summer, fall. Um, days and years. The day, of course, is a function of the sun. As is the year, the month is a function of the moon, the seasons. God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. He placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. Now as we go to the fifth day, the way this account reads, we have a world that's created, we have the sun and the moon, we have vegetation, but we have no animals. And what starts now is on the fifth day that life in the sea is created and the birds of the air. Everything is very carefully laid out by a sense of distinction. A bird is not a land animal and vice versa. And a bird is not a land animal, is not a fish. And it keeps saying that they beget 
their own kind after their kind. Which, one of the things with the way evolution is taught that doesn't seem to work is saying that, for instance, a man came from a monkey. It's probably not true. I'm not God, so I can't be definite here. But it would appear if God brought about animals, plants, through a process of evolution, then they came from their own kind. That's not to say that one source couldn't go many ways. I find it amazing that we think this is a point of faith. And that if you believe that God took a long time to create, it, to create things, then you're not a believer. You have to believe it's six 24-hour days. And I would just say, why don't we just leave that in God's hands and agree with God that he created it? And the way he did it is fine. I mean, I don't know about you, but when you start to study physiological systems and you find out that the osmotic gradient of your blood is the same as seawater, that tells me something. Or, or even get lower. Yeah. But what I'm saying, and I there seems to be God's imprint on it, right? That's exactly right. I, and I just, I think the place you get in trouble is telling the Creator how He did it. Instead, I think a scientist should say, God, how did you do this? And like 141 says, embrace the truth. Now, Colleen had her hand up and then Doug. Well, see, the thing is, is that that seems to fit the science. Well, I mean, where we came into existence. See, that, that the thing I guess I would say is that we need to stop being afraid of how God did it. Yeah, see, if God did it through evolution, hallelujah. If he didn't, hallelujah. But it's not a matter of faith, and we have people, I mean, I know people that when they find out that I'm not a 100% a 6, 24-hour day person, they, they think my faith is questionable. Go ahead, Brother Doug. Well, I was going to read what she quoted, it's 162, and this is verse 13. Now that the fowl of the air has been exalted from its kind in the seas, and then from its kind in the earth, so also has that man been exalted from his kind in the seas, and then from his kind in the earth, and before he was man. Yeah, and see, Greg mentioned something that I find kind of significant, and I haven't studied it deeply. Uh, Teresa probably has more, maybe Greg has. But when you look at the chromosomes in any animal, what you find out is the huge correlation. I mean, if you were to look at the DNA of a person as compared to a mouse, it isn't that different. What is it, Teresa? Your DNA. And, and you have to understand how you count that out. But right, but... You're 60% the same as a banana. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going bananas. <laughs> but uh, see, what that shows me, though, I don't get afraid of that. That shows to me that God is in it. That it's... It, uh, but, and this, this account of creation keeps pointing out there's separation. I'm not a banana. A banana is a wonderful thing that God created. I'm a human being. And... We need to, to get to the end here. Go ahead, Laws. Well, I should just, the, the arrogance that we have people. You know, I mean, even today where you look at the internet and, and you look at that concept, you know, as, as opposed to, you know, 50 years ago when, when someone would say, that's impossible. That's impossible. And, and, you know, the arrogance of us to say, you can't do it that way, God, because I don't get it that way. It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, we're so arrogant. But it is, I find it odd. Well, here's the thing is that when we do that as believers, we set people up to lose their faith. Because we say, if you truly believe, then this is true. And then when people start to investigate and it doesn't look like that's true, they don't have a, a place to recognize 
that it, it's not about making God fit our thoughts. It's about finding out what he did. You know, I, I think of a, a classic story I read about a girl who grew up with a dad who was a cult watcher. He was one of these, he was like the Bible answer man, but he wasn't. I forgot the name of his ministry, but he had an answer for everything. He knew uh, why Mormons were a cult, and, he, and he, was, he would go around and confront people, debate people in a nice way. But his girl grew up trying so hard to be perfect for him. But everything hinged on being able to prove it from Scripture. And one day, somebody tested her on the fact that, well, if, if God's the same yesterday, today, and forever, how come pig was unclean in the Old Testament and now it's not? That undid her faith. The way she had been taught, it completely undid her and she threw it all off and now she says she's free. And I, I read her story and it broke my heart because what her father had told her was belief was so hard, it was so oppressive, it, was so, it wasn't release, it wasn't loving people. It was making them be right. And we need to be careful of that, like you said, to be so arrogant. You know, God is love, and all this is about showing his love. And when we make it, I mean, it's so easy to want to do this. If you understand it the way I do, you're right. If you don't, you're wrong. And uh, I want, we need to finish. I just want to mention, in the sixth day, we know what God did. You know, the fifth day, the sea, animals, and the birds. In the sixth day, he created the beast, and then it says he created man. And here's the thing about the Bible story that I see is so crucial to know. He says, I made man in my image, male and female. And then he doesn't say it was good. He says it was very good. It was tov meod. It was very good. And I think, you know, when you look at some of the stuff we get into as people, is there anything more important than knowing? that every human being bears the image of God. To me, that just, it changes my life, it changes how I see everything, and it, it makes man not quantitatively different from animals. And a lot of people say, well, we're just the highest animal. Well, biologically, that's probably true. But there's a Holy Spirit within us that makes us different. You know, it's like Greg was saying, God speaks today. God spoke to Greg in a dream. Why? Greg is in the image of God. Sister Betsy. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you had... Anyway, uh, the creation story is a wonderful story, but I, I really think it's important. What you said, Lois, is a good way to look at it. Let's not be arrogant and tell God what he did. Let's be thankful for what he did and believe what he says. Let's all stand... Sister Karma, would you close for us, please? Father, we just thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day and being able to come together and to speak of your glorious, wonderful creations and all of these things that we're learning. And Father, we just pray that you'll bless us, that we'll keep these things in our hearts. And